Everybody give a nice warm welcome. Brandon Rose. My name's Brandon. Awesome. This is my, uh, uh, th thank you uh, to the uh, organizers for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. Uh, it's really exciting to come to local Python conferences. What is most exciting is when I come to a local conference and hardly recognize a single face. I have been to local conferences that feel kind of like a recycling of one of the big ones. Faces are familiar. I kind of know all the people there. It's so exciting to get to a conference and know that it has gotten in hundreds of people from its local community, hundreds of people to get together who haven't seen each other's faces before, here to learn together. I want to take you back to December 1929, a young Oxford professor, J.R.R. Tolkien, has a secret. It's a bit of a habit that he practices secretly, alone, at home, known only to his family. He writes things. He writes things about elves. <laughs> this is a dire secret at Oxford. He, uh, as we might, someday you know, might get crazy and decide to just try inventing a new programming language at home just to see what it's like. He's an expert in human languages and has been developing life-size languages that the elves could have spoken. He has been developing their linguistic history. That's the fun thing about human languages, is they change over time. And in order to know when the elven languages would have branched from one another, and then when they would have met and traded loan words later, he had to come up with a whole cycle of high heroic legends for the elves, so he would know the history of the languages he was inventing. All in secret. And Tolkien needed an audience. Now, I can already guess your question. Why would J.R.R. Tolkien need an audience? Why would a compulsive elf chronicler need further encouragement? Please remember, this is a man who, starting in 1920, when his children were small, and they wrote uh, letters to Father Christmas, uh, disguised his handwriting and wrote responses back to them. The children came to know Father Christmas, his sort of comic sidekick, North Polar Bear, the snowman who lived out front. And it was 10 years into the process, 1929, that it finally occurred to Tolkien to mention the elves that live at the North Pole. Elves live at the North Pole. Elves, you can see the wheels beginning to turn in Tolkien's mind. If there are elves, there must be caves under the North Pole. These uh, Santa uh, rediscovers when um, polar bear gets lost in them in 1932. And what is that over to the left? What is in the shadows just out of reach of the torchlight? If there are elves, there must be goblins <laughs> right under the North Pole. And if you know anything about Tolkien, you know that in 1933's Christmas letter, the situation will break out into all-out war. More than one, <laughs> an army of more than 1,000 goblins assor, uh, assaults North Pole. Uh, the text mentions that Mr. Polar Bear personally kills over 100 before the elves. <laughs> can rush to his assistance, and you can see that the Christmas letter from Santa that year was illustrated with a, a pair of elves being mauled by the bear <laughs> as he steps on and crushes to death a third. 
Tolkien could not write letters back to his children at Christmas without attacking Santa Claus. <laughs> so your question is probably initially not. How could we encourage Tolkien to write more? You are probably asking, how can this man possibly be stopped? <laughs> why did he need an audience? This is why. Have you ever uh, scrolled to the bottom of your GitHub repositories, down to those ones that never quite got finished? that no one else has ever looked at, that have never uh, been forked or seen by a single person except for you, Tolkien might have lived and died with a GitHub repository <laughs> <laughs> these, uh, these are works that he died without publishing. Projects he started things he worked on briefly or worked on for decades that just never made it in front of an audience. He needed an audience, not only so that we would ever have heard his name or have heard of his stories, but as we will see, because finally finding an audience transformed his writing. Writers, you are a writer. Maybe you just write tweets, texts, emails. Maybe you're a writer of programs. Whatever kind of writing you do, I think you can benefit by studying writers and how they work because whatever, whichever of those kinds of writing you do, you will find that many things that are true of other writers are, I think, true about you. And so I'm going to look at this talk at Tolkien as a writer to see what lessons we can learn from it. This whole talk is taken from a book I read recently, The Company They Keep, by Tolkien scholar Diana pavlik Glyer, uh, uh, who teaches out in Los Angeles. Tolkien finally took the risk, after many years of working on elven myths at home, of showing his work to someone in 1929 when he uh, loaned the lay, that's an old English word for a poem, the lay of Lithian, to a fellow scholar, uh, Jack Lewis, taught at Oxford, and they would had a lot of conversations together and had the same taste in old Saxon epics and old literature in Europe. And Tolkien finally thought that this might be the person to spring some of his elf writing on. <laughs> Jack Lewis wrote back the next day, it is ages since I have had such an evening of delight. He said if it hadn't even been written by one of his friends, if he'd picked it up anonymously in a bookstore, he would have been just as delighted. Tolkien, writing years later in a letter, said he was for long my only audience. Only from him did I ever get the idea that my stuff could be more than a private hobby. But having an audience didn't just mean that his stuff was listened to, it means that it started to change. Because there's something else that a writer needs. Julie Steele, in her talk yesterday here at Pi Gotham, uh, in talking about visual communication, said good stories are not about the teller. She quoted Steinbeck, if a good story, if a story is not about the hearer, he will not listen. Tolkien needed a critic, someone who would close a feedback loop between what he thought an audience would like and what an actual live other reader would respond to. He needed someone who would help him make that leap of discovering what other people and other minds are really like which is to say different than ourselves, and learned what could really please somebody else. So about two weeks later, in response to this poem, Jack Lewis sent back 14 pages dense with criticism. But Tolkien, this, this was the, Tolkien had revealed his secret. How could Jack do this with, without, without 
making Tolkien close back up again. He was clever. He gave back a dialogue, a conversation between four scholars about this ancient manuscript that they had dug up, which meant that when making criticism, Jack could make the scholars talk about the errors that all of the scribes had made as they had copied this manuscript down through the centuries. The scholars said things like, oh, the latest redactors were always needlessly amplifying, as if the imagination of their readers could do nothing for itself. The assonance you know, must originally have occurred often and have been suppressed elsewhere by the scribes. <laughs> He had, in some cases, Lewis went so far as to rewrite some passages for Tolkien, so he just had the scholars quote from another copy of the manuscript they <laughs> dug up and argued that this much better version of the passage must have been the original. Um, and it worked. Tolkien was enthralled. Somebody really understood his work, but understood it so well that they could see weaknesses in it that he could not and he began sharing regularly. He was very fortunate in his choice of a first critic because throughout his life, Jack was good at sensitive criticism. Um, a, a children's book illustrator uh, remembers she, she was um, very new in the field and was drawing illustrations for one of Jack's books. They, uh, they weren't coming out very well. And so what Jack told her is, I know that you made the children rather plain in the interests of realism. But do you think you could possibly pretty them up a little now? <laughs> and and uh, in a letter later in her life, she said that was the nicest criticism she ever got about one of her drawings. Um, so Jack and uh, Tollers, as uh, Tolkien's friends called him, were soon meeting with more writers, but in a context where criticism could be more bruising, a group of writers started to get together every week. They called themselves the Inklings in uh, Lewis's apartments in uh, Maudlin College, uh, Oxford. Um, they met in his rooms, and Jack was the center of the group. Uh, a friend remembered him as a big man with a large red face and shabby clothes addressing his audience in a big, booming voice. He was, he was a big brawler of an intellect, and kind of went in for rougher criticism uh, than uh, many other scholars enjoyed. Uh, but he collected around him a group of friends, most of whom were not sensitive like Tolkien, and loved the brawling attitude. Dr. Hobbard said later, this was the ethos of the whole thing, that criticism was free. Uh, Jack's own brother, uh, Warren Lewis, said praise for good work was unstinted, but censure for bad work, or even not so good work, was often brutally frank. Had an outsider, that he recounts this after a particularly fun evening that he really enjoyed, had an outsider eavesdropped, he would have thought at a meeting of fell enemies, hurling deadly insults before drawing their guns. This is what intellectual life was like for Jack and his friends at Oxford. To read to the Inklings, said Warney, was a formidable ordeal. The Inklings did do one thing correct amongst all their arguments. They always read drafts, first or second drafts, to one another. Uh, Anne Ruggles Gear, uh, I believe she's at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, uh, a lifelong expert on both writers and writing, and writing circles, um, says that most groups do this. They read early drafts. Uh, but in some writers' groups that she's observed and researched, she's noticed something that can sometimes go very wrong. When participants in writing groups read finished writing, the language of the group often became acerbic or vacuous. The critics kind of either don't plug in and say anything useful, or they're kind of triggered to go on the attack. Why this different reception of finished work? She says because members felt, perhaps unconsciously, that they had no purpose. <laughs> 
if something is almost already complete, she thinks, a critic will feel kind of helpless in the face of something they, they maybe now think was all done wrong. And from that frustration will go on the attack against it. Um, I had always kind of known from many different kinds of writing I've done that it's always easier as the person receiving criticism to have it be a very early draft. So I've wasted less time on a stupid idea in it and can fix it early rather than late in the process. But Gears research suggests that it's also easier for the person giving the criticism that they are less likely to become angry, more likely to respond in a controlled manner when they know they're in the process early rather than having to look at something that's nearly finished. I thought that was an interesting result. Something that the Inklings uh, often ran into was that their particular criticism made writers think about clever writing versus clear writing. And this is, when you're a writer, you often do something. You're like, oh, this is clever. But uh, Dr. Hovard again said all the Inklings had learned by experience that passages valued most by the writer appealed least to the reader. They found that when writing English prose, it just didn't work, at least with this group, to be clever. Everyone would groan and roll their eyes and ask if you could redo it where it was clear instead. Tolkien now needed just one last thing. Tolkien needed a deadline. How did he get one? Well, back in the early 30s, uh, around the same time that the elves were attacking, the, the goblins were attacking Father Christmas, uh, he had written and read to his children uh, uh, an adventure story called The Hobbit. He'd never quite, he, he, I think he finished telling it to them, uh, didn't quite finish writing it out, and then they got a little old for the story and he put it aside. Maybe no one would ever seen it. Uh, it started quite famously. He was in the middle of, of, of grading exams and was just miserable. And in kind of a fit of needing to be creative, he flipped over one of the exams and wrote, he doesn't know where the sentence came from, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And the sentence stuck with him, and he finally wrote a story to find out what a hobbit was. He didn't know. And it turned into this whole set of stories for his children. Eventually, he loaned the manuscript around. Jack Lewis loved it. So Tolkien lent it to Elaine Griffiths, a student who gave it to a friend a bit later, Susan Dagnall, who was out in London working for a publisher named Stanley Un Un Unwin, who took it home, gave it to his uh, first chapter to his son, uh, Rainer, and said, tell me if you like it. Rainer liked it very much. Uh, they tracked down Tolkien at uh, Oxford and convinced him he could be a very popular children's writer. So over 36 and 37, it was finished and it was published because he now had someone waiting on him. Um, as Christmas started to come up, his Tolkien's little son, Christopher, wrote a letter, a letter to Father Christmas telling Father Christmas to buy many copies of the book for England's children. <laughs> it apparently worked because in Christmas 1937, thousands and thousands of parents rushed out to get this new children's book. Uh, the publisher wrote him, we had to rush the reprint through. The crisis was so acute that we fetched part of the reprint from our printers in a private car. And they ended with an ominous warning. A large public will be clamoring next year to hear more from you about hobbits. <laughs> Let's now watch as these three elements, all of which are now lined up, an audience, a critic so that he hears back from an audience, and a deadline, now work together as Tolkien tries to write a sequel. He was dismayed. He wrote to his editor, not ever intending any sequel. I fear I have squandered all my favorite motifs and characters on the original Hobbit. 
he tried. He wrote chapter one, a long expected party, and through about three chapters worth of material, came up with the following plot devices. Hobbits talking. Hobbits eating meals. And hobbits playing pranks on one another. He actually admitted he was having a great time. Hobbit talk, he wrote, amuses me more than adventures. I can contemplate them eating and making their rather fatuous jokes indefinitely. <laughs> so he was on his way to a sequel and tried reading it to the Inklings, who were not <laughs> amused. <laughs> Tolkien didn't know what to do. And then, on July 24th, 1938, his future was made. He had a conversation with his best friend Jack, and he wrote this to his editor. Mr. Lewis says, Hobbits are only amusing when in un-hobbit-like situations. Hobbits are only amusing when in un-hobbit-like situations? And he went back to the beginning of the story and started over. This was the pivot. This was the spark that set everything else in motion. Five weeks later, he writes this to uh, uh, his editor. It is now flowing along and getting quite out of hand. <laughs> it has reached, in five weeks, it has reached about chapter seven and progresses towards quite unforeseen goals. <laughs> Prodded by his friend, Tolkien was now doing something that he literally had never imagined. The first Hobbit, uh, the first book, The Hobbit, had sent a Hobbit out into a fairy tale. This new book would send a Hobbit out into an epic set in the last days of all of these elven legends that he had been developing for decades. This would finally surface them where the public would get to learn a little about them. I should also mention that two years before, 36, um, uh, there was a bit of a wager between he and his friend Jack. Um, they'd been complaining to each other about how there weren't any books that they really enjoyed reading coming out in fiction. And uh, so Jack proposed a wager. They would toss, they tossed a coin, which decided that Jack would write a space travel story and Tolkien a time travel story, and they would see who could produce a work that both of them would love. Um, uh, 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 Jack actually came out with three sci-fi books, which are fairly widely acclaimed. Uh, Tolkien never finished his time travel work, but the fact that the time traveler in what he wrote went back to an ancient island and found that he had landed on Atlantis right before it was destroyed provided a mythos that could stand behind the history of men in Tolkien's new epic, just as the elven legends stood behind the history of his elves. And in that letter to his editor that things were moving again, the name changed. For the first time, he does not call it the new hobbit. He calls it the Lord of the Ring, because under the influence of an audience, it is becoming something completely different. He did come to a halt in 19, late 1942. Uh, in 1943, he was an air raid warden as the world uh, had descended into war. He was an air raid warden for Oxford. Two of his sons were in the war uh, and at times on other continents, uh, and he wrote nothing and proclaimed himself dead stuck writing not a line, not even touching the project for an entire year. What got him going again? In 44, he had time to get together for lunch with Jack Lewis, who read to Tolkien from a new book that Jack was writing. Tolkien couldn't believe it. His friend was writing another book. Uh, Jack urged Tolkien to resume the work, and so Tolkien started up again 
writing to his son, Christopher, out at war, I have seriously embarked and have been stit sitting up rather late. Christopher was actually another very important audience for Tolkien, because Tolkien early on was sending him chapters of The Lord of the Rings in South Africa to give him something that would remind him of home while he was overseas. And Tolkien says, I've gone back to San and Frodo. At the moment, they are just meeting Gollum on a precipice. So Tolkien was now moving again, and the Inklings began again to be subjected to regular readings from Tolkien. Did I just use the word subjected? <laughs> well, it turns out not all of them appreciated uh, being made a part of such a long project. Uh, Dr. John Wayne said when Tolkien came through the door at a meeting of the Inklings, with a bulging, pocket jack uh, bulging jacket pocket, I winced. Because I knew we were in for a slab of Gandalf and Bilbo Baggins and the rest of it. Uh, uh, one of Jack Lewis's other best friends, Dr. Owen Barfield, said, I just can't, he privately admitted later, I just can't get into that Lord of the Rings trilogy. I can't finish it. But these two gentlemen at least kept quiet, and endured the readings. This was not the case with Hugo Dyson, a big personality who for years had taught English at Oxford. He was quite vocal in his objections and his ideas. When Tolkien pulled out a manuscript, Hugo would grab his cocktail, fling himself down on the couch, and interrupt regularly interrupt Tolkien with Hugo's legendary Oxford wit. <laughs> Dyson interrupted Tolkien every time Tolkien was reading. Uh, by this time, Christopher Tolkien was uh, grown up out of the armed forces back at Oxford and sometimes attending the meetings and seeing this. He wrote later, I remember this very vividly. My father's pain, his shyness, which couldn't take Hugo's extremely rumbustious approach. Now it happened that Tolkien never had to answer, and never did, so far as we know, have to answer the insult himself. Whenever Hugo came out with one of his witticisms, Jack, host of the meeting, would always jump right in, in his big brawling manner, shut up, Hugo! Come on, tallers, and get Tolkien reading again. Tolkien always had a defender, always had a champion, standing ready to defend him. He was defended every time that he was attacked. But in the end, it seems it did not matter. In 1947, the moment finally came when Tolkien would no longer read from The New Hobbit when Dyson was present. Uh, again, uh, Jack's brother Warren, in his diary, just as we were starting, Hugo Dyson came in, and we had to stop. This is how to shut Tolkien down. Not simply with critique. Not simply with criticism. To shut Tolkien down, you must practice opposition. You must become his opponent. Then, it doesn't matter in the end whether everyone jumps to Tolkien's defense or not, because eventually, eventually, Tolkien will tire of needing over and over to be defended. The Inklings meetings around this time began to falter. They appear less often in uh, the members' diaries. There were other issues other frictions, people were growing older, family members were getting sick, 
all sorts of things happen in people's lives. But another thing that was happening at the time is that Jack Lewis decided to also try writing fantasy. I mean, he, he idolized Tolkien and what Tolkien was doing as he wrote and what it did to Jack as he read it. And he also decided to try writing fantasy. It turns out, though, it was fantasy of a somewhat different sort. Tolkien found it about as bad as can be. I don't know if you've ever seen a community where, where someone is inspired by a famous person to try something themselves, and the famous person just is like, that's awful. <laughs> but that's what happened to Jack Lewis. He wrote a story that starts as a children's adventure. Fine, that's one genre. They meet a Greek faun, which is really kind of a very frightening kind of Greek creature, if you know the legends. Only, wait, as you read, you find it's not a Greek faun. It just looks like a faun. It has a cute little muffler and keeps its tail over its arm and sips tea. So it's not really a faun at all, but it's from Greek mythology, but it's not. There's a wicked snow queen. Okay, that's from Northern myths, myths and Hans Christian Andersen. Nothing to do with fauns. Father Christmas then comes into the story, which is from a completely different cycle of traditions, and then there's a big lion. <laughs> I will not deny that Tolkien had, a few, in the previous year or two, begun to have suspicions, but what a terrible way to have it finally confirmed that his friend, Jack Lewis, was a writer of crossover fan fiction. <laughs> I mean, the very title of the work, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, is just a list of things. <laughs> you might be. I, I know people who adore stories. Um, where uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi finally gets to meet Captain Kirk on the bridge <laughs> of the Enterprise. Look on the internet. This is a whole genre. Some people love it and adore it. Tolkien, not one of those people. For Tolkien, having a fawn and a snow queen and Father Christmas in the same story is the same kind of horrendous uh, car crash of a um, fanfic mashup. I mean, just to take one thing, Father Christmas. Logically, if they're already celebrating Christmas in this universe, that must mean Christ has already come and is being in some form celebrated, right? Because universes are to be consistent. If that is the case, why does this lion talk so much like Jesus? <laughs> Again, this is a book that has become, that, that, that actually I love very much, and that millions of people have loved very much. And Tolkien was actually very uh, sad that he was never able to join in that, never able to appreciate it, because to him, it was a, just a careless jumble of ideas brought together, and it probably didn't help that he knew it only took Jack about two months to write, <laughs> was immediately released and started competing very well with The Hobbit for sales. I don't know if either of them cared about that, but to be able to, to, to write major children's literature in a month or two, I, I think kind of discouraged Tolkien. Uh, this is interesting. It kind of shows or suggests that much as we would like them to be, writers are not interchangeable. Even writers that seem initially to enjoy the same things, very often I have been in situations where writers of various sorts are expected to go from writing one kind of thing and well, now we have a project that requires this. You can do that, right? And just expected it. Admit it, the invisible hand of Adam Smith expects us to be interchangeable parts that can move on to any side, uh, kind of project, any kind of writing activity, and plug right in and be productive. But if the experience of Tolkien and Lewis is correct, it seems to suggest that writers are not interchangeable. 
that there are some things we're just not going to be able to pull ourselves into, and where if we do attempt them, we're not going to be giving our readers or people relying on our writing what they could really get from us. Um, one last thing that does seem to have happened in one of the later Inklings meetings is that uh, all we have is a letter from Tolkien to Lewis apologizing for hurting his feelings. We don't know, uh, we can't tell from the letter what work was being reviewed or what Tolkien said about it. But in the end, it looks like even Jack Lewis, the big brawler of an intellect on the Oxford campus, was eventually hurt in this big free-for-all that he had loved to create in his rooms on Thursday nights at Oxford. 1949, this is from Warney Lewis's diary. Thursday, 20th of October, no one turned up after dinner. The next week, no inklings tonight, and the meeting was at an end. It's never mentioned again in anyone's diary. It petered out, and it finally sort of collapsed, exhausted. All right, well, back to our bigger story. What effect is this, is this going to have on the Lord of the Rings? Well, look at the year. We've made it to 1949. We've done it. Tolkien is finally finished and submits the first draft of the completed Lord of the Rings to his publisher. All he needed now was just to edit everything to make it perfect, which he did in 1950 and 1951 and 1952 and 1953 and early, middle, and late in 1954, even as the first volumes of The Lord of the Rings started to go to press. It was such an enormous work, they had to split it into three volumes and spend several months putting it into production. His achievement was so large. He had taken so long to write it that his editor was Rainer Onion, Un uh, Unwin, the son of Stanley Unwin, <laughs> who had been given the first chapter of The Hobbit all of those years ago at home to be asked whether he had liked it. And he then, not his father, is the one that was editor to finally bring the sequel into print. It eventually, of course, sold more than 150 million copies worldwide, which is somewhat more than The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe. <laughs> Tolkien lived almost 20 more years and he never published another book. Essays, yes. Some short stories, some poems, yes. But he never got together another full-length book. He never got audience, critics, and, and a publisher interested in the material lined up together again to make him go back outside of his private writings and try to do something else like that. He returned to his endless work with elven legend, history, and language. He no longer had to keep it a secret, and he could show the drafts of what he was doing to the publisher. But he was writing for himself now. He no longer had that feedback loop with an audience, and so it, nothing ever came of it. The Silmarillion, uh, as after his death, his son finally published it, it never went through the wrenching process of having to be critiqued and reworked in order to face other readers. Um, it does have an appreciative audi audience today, but not the kind of audience that Tolkien could reach when he was plugged into some good critics. I sum up. Being a good critic is an art. And unless you do all of your writing alone and for only your eyes, you are a writer and a critic both. To the extent that people 
can't help investing themselves in what they write, you are, when you criticize, really doing surgery not only on the work, but on the person. Being a good critic is an art because it's like being a surgeon. Do you know that a surgeon always uses the sharpest possible instrument? Because with the sharpest possible instrument, a surgeon can do the least damage. It's with dull instruments or blunt instruments that real damage is done. A surgeon can often do work with a sharp in instrument without even causing pain. Good criticism is sharp in that way. Narrow, limited, pointed, aiming right at the thing you want to address without causing extra gratuitous damage to the work or to the person you're critiquing. In earlier phases of Western history, this would have been the first thing you were taught at school. Rhetoric, speaking, arguing, making limited defensible points, and then stopping without generalizing to everything you thought about a person or a piece of uh, art. Today, other kinds of writers besides ourselves or any of you that have been in creative writing programs know that in a creative writing program, you spend week, uh, week after week after week practicing criticism, bringing essays into class and sitting around and learning to critique. You're bad at it at first. You cause damage at first. You get people angry at first. But as you practice and practice and practice in that kind of curriculum, you hopefully start to become good at it. But how often are technical people with our backgrounds ever taught the sensitive, sensitive art of critique? Being a good critic is an art. It's worth pursuing. It's worth studying. It's something on which there is a wide body of literature and research results. If only we step back and begin to think of ourselves as writers. Thank you very much.